What I want to do first is just explain what is going to be um, in this session, in, in this lecture. Um, the first thing that we're going to consider is how migration and displacement um, are discussed within this wider framework of the climate change negotiations. So the first and most obvious thing to point out is that the climate change negotiations, the COP process, the conference of the parties that takes place every year is, is an enormous process. It is a meeting of um, most of the world's states to try and agree or agree further on how they're going to tackle climate change, ranging from everything from uh, how adaptation is going to be funded to which countries are going to reduce their emissions by, by when, by what date. So e essentially any, any element of climate change that is a matter of, of concern for a national government is agreed upon and debated at this, at this process, at these negotiations every year. And the, the part of those negotiations that is concerned with migration and displacement is, is a small part of a much, much bigger set of, uh, set of discussions, set of agreements, set of ongoing conversations between states. So the first thing that we're going to do is just look in a little bit of detail at at how migration and displacement fit into that wider process. The second thing we're going to do is look at um, what has happened between <clears throat> the climate change negotiations that took part in Paris in 2015, several years ago, and what is going on right now at the climate change negotiations in Poland, pretty much as we speak there. They are concluding this week. And the reason for that is that it is the it was the talks in Paris in 2015 which were the real turning point, the real milestone where countries finally, after several decades, agreed a binding agreement to reduce their emissions uh, and agreed several other things around um, adaptation, how, how, how globally we're going to adapt to climate change impacts. And until Paris, until 2015, the talks had been kind of grinding on relatively slowly. They'd They'd reached various crunch points where things hadn't really been agreed, where, where the process really was stuck. And then a lot of that changed in 2015 at the Paris talks. And since then, um, progress has been, has been better. It's been quicker. Um, things have been kind of moving, th moving through the, the process of agreement faster. So 2015 was this real turning point. That's why it's there as a marker. That's why we're, we're examining what has happened between 2015 and the climate change talks that are going on at the moment. The third thing that we're going to, going to do is acknowledge and explore the fact that um, the climate change negotiations are not, of course, the only place where climate link migration and displacement are discussed and agreed upon. So what we're going to do is look, firstly, look critically um, a sort of a critically appraise whether the climate change negotiations are the best place for the world to agree on climate link migration and displacement, examine what can and can't be agreed within that framework, and then look at the other international processes that are taking place at the moment that fill in some of those gaps. And hopefully at the end, come to some assessment of how these different pieces of the jigsaw fit together. So that's an outline of the session. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is just proceed with our, our first point, which is looking at the climate negotiations and, and human mobility. So the first question is, why, why is it that climate link migration is, is discussed and agreed upon at all <clears throat> at the climate change negotiations? And I think this is, this is worth examining because I think... Um, when I speak to people about this, depending on the field that they work in, they tend to have a very different answer. So some people who um, work quite specifically on climate change and environmental issues will have an intuitive answer to this, which is that, of course, climate link migration and displacement should be discussed and agreed upon at the climate change negotiations, at the climate process. That's, that's the logical place to do it. It's to do with climate change. It's part of this domain. Uh, and... That's, you know, that, 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 that's one answer to that question, but I think we're going to come back to that and look at it a little bit critically later. 
When I speak to people who work more specifically on refugee issues, when I speak to people who work on migration rights, when I speak to people who work in international aid and development, um, their take on whether uh, migration displacement should be negotiated and, and agreed upon at the climate talks is, is a little bit more sceptical, a little bit more circumspect. They say, well, you know, this is... Um, you know, th th this is a this is a process that's really about climate change and its impact. It's not really about people. It's not really about their rights. It's not really geared up to to discuss migration and displacement at all. So this um, th th this question does need to be sort of justified. This this idea of having um, uh, having an element of the climate talks which is about migration and displacement does need some examination and justification. Um, and my view is that in some ways it is, it is a logical place for these issues to be discussed. And the key reason for that is that this is all, you know, it's already an existing framework. It's a, it's a set up international uh, policy and political process that it meets every year for a main meeting in December. It, it has its structures and processes already set up. Um, it's kind of geared up to to meet and agree and for states to meet and agree on, on complicated and difficult things. So in a way, why not add uh, climate link migration and displacement into this process given that it, it already exists? The, the next thing that I think um, justifies uh, clim climate link migration and displacement being part of the uh, international climate process of the COP process is that it's a process, uh, it's a set of negotiations that already involves um, most countries in the world. Most countries are already bought into this process. They send delegates, they send negotiators, their governments have agreed to be part of the process and by and large um, states attend and negotiate. So the fact that it has this kind of uh, existing global buy-in is really important. Of course, over the last few years, we've seen some states uh, kind of uh, leaving the process or leaving parts of the process, and and that is a problem. But nonetheless, it's it is this global, it, it kind of already established global forum that most countries are participating in, and that means that it's a it it, it does lend itself to um, to to being able to facilitate countries to meet and agree specifically on climate link migration. So that's why um, that, that's sort of the justification for it being part of this process at all. I'm not saying that we should be uncritical about that, but nonetheless I think it's good to begin with an explanation of why in some, in some senses it does make a lot of sense to be talking about displacement at the climate change negotiations. So this next session is looking at what happened in Paris, what's happened uh, in between, and, and what's happening this year. So what I'm going to do first is look at what happened in Paris, because as I said, this was a really key turning point in the whole climate change negotiations, a really key turning point in the whole process. And I think it's worth, before I look specifically at what happened in terms of migration and displacement, to say something about... Um, more generally what happened at the Paris climate change negotiations to give you a sense of um, to, to give you a sense of why it was a turning point uh, for the whole process and then look a little bit at why it was also a turning point on migration and displacement. So if you uh, if you can recall nearly a decade ago uh, going back even further there was a set of disastrous climate change negotiations in Copenhagen in 2009 and a lot of expectations had been built up around what was going to happen in Copenhagen. Um, it had been billed as <clears throat> the event where world leaders would meet and they would agree this conclusive, ambitious, uh, binding agreement that would be you know, how the world dealt with climate change. And I think lots of countries went into that process uh, really believing that at the end of the Copenhagen climate negotiations, that's exactly what would happen, that we would leave those climate talks 
with this document that set out exactly how climate change was going to be halted or how at least it was going to be slowed down uh, and that there would be agreement on emissions reductions, which states would do what and when and how everything was going to be financed. Now, that was a huge, huge disappointment because actually none of that happened at Copenhagen. Uh, we left Copenhagen um, really with, with nothing. And that sort of set the whole process um, back. It was a huge disappointment. I think that within civil society, organizations that had been advocating around the climate change negotiations, that had been, had been working to push governments into that process to encourage them to be more ambitious, to buy into the process, um, were enormously disappointed. It was a kind of huge kind of deflating moment for, for civil society across the world. Also for, um, for poorer countries, for more vulnerable countries that had really been uh, depending on actually getting um, a decent agreement at Copenhagen as a matter of, well, as a matter of survival in many ways, um, were disappointed, were angry, were, um, you know, really felt like they'd been let down by the richer, more developed, higher emitting countries that um, they'd been you know, they'd been promised something would come out of the Copenhagen talks, and in the end it didn't. So this was, this was kind of really the, the low point. Copenhagen 2009, immediately after that, was really the low point in the climate change talks. Um, and it was also a point where a lot of scepticism came into the process. People began to wonder whether this, this whole idea of having these, you know, this, this uh, annual global negotiation processes that were established could ever um, achieve what was needed. Um, so that was the kind of like really dark, uh, dark few years immediately after that, until um, a kind of new energy began to gather around having another go at trying to reach a global binding agreement on, on climate change. And, and the date for all sorts of reasons that was set for that was 2015 negotiations, so six years after the disastrous Copenhagen negotiations, and they would take place in Paris. And in the run-up to the Paris negotiations, there was, um, uh, I think, the people that I spoke to were expecting a lot less. They were much more cynical about the process. A lot of people were saying, well, remember what happened at Copenhagen? Remember how uh, we all got our hopes up that there would be this fantastic deal would come out of it? Um, and in the end, the, 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 the whole process was, was a letdown. So people approached the 2015 Paris talks with much more cynicism, much more scepticism, which I think was probably healthy. But nonetheless, at the Paris uh, climate change talks, uh, an agreement was reached. And lots of people were critical of the agreement. And I think many of those criticisms are completely legitimate. But nonetheless, an agreement was reached um, and agreed upon, which did several really important things. And the key among them was an agreement amongst nations, a binding agreement amongst the world's nations, to limit global warming to uh, well below two degrees. And this two degrees figure has become a really important part of the whole climate change negotiations process. And when you hear people talking about one and a half degrees or two degrees, what they're talking about is the average amount of global warming that, that is acceptable to them, okay? So, of course, different countries, different people think that different levels of average global warming are acceptable. Two degrees is, is sort of uh, universally thought to be the, the absolute upper limit of what is okay. Um, however, for many, many nations, for many uh, more vulnerable countries, for many more climate vulnerable communities, Two degrees is already way too high. Two degrees is, is already um, creating scenarios for them which are potentially unlivable, which are potentially disastrous. So what the, what the Paris Agreement did was <clears throat> agree to keep uh, average warming to well below, that's a quote, well below two degrees and as close to, possi as close to possible as 1.5 degrees. So this was certainly a compromise. Um, it's certainly a temperature agreement that not everyone is happy with because um, for, for many people, for many countries, that, that two degree limit is, is too high. But nonetheless, it was, uh, what happened at Paris was an agreement. Um, 
And I think that that needs to be uh, acknowledged as something positive because when you look back to Copenhagen, what we know is it's perfectly possible to go into these negotiations um, and come out with nothing. So for that reason, Paris was really, really, um, was really a turning point um, in, in the whole process. And this agreement on limiting global warming was not the only thing that, that was agreed upon as part, of the, as part of the agreement that came out of those negotiations. And amongst many, many other things, um, something else that came out of that process was an agreement for states to begin examining what climate change will mean for them in terms of displacement. And I'm just going to show you um, the exact text of what got what got agreed there. So at Paris, this is this is the actual text that was that was agreed specifically um, about about migration and displacement. I'll, I'll read it out exactly. Um, so the agreement encourages parties to incorporate or continue to incorporate the consideration of extreme events and slow onset events, non-economic losses, and here's the key bit, displacement, migration, and human mobility as com and comprehensive risk management into rele relevant planning and action as appropriate and to encourage bilateral and multilateral entities to support such efforts. So I, I know that that is... Um, it, it's a very long sentence and it, it, it has an amount of jargon in it, but it is really, really important because what it is, is it's a piece of text in a global agreement that specifies that as part of that agreement, parties, by which it means the states, the countries that have signed up to it, are encouraged, okay, encouraged to incorporate and consider displacement, migration and human mobility uh, in, into their national policies. Um, and into how they think about managing climate change risks and into any other agree separate agreements that they make bilaterally with other countries or multilaterally with, with groups of countries, okay? So although on the surface this seems like a kind of a long-winded way of saying something, it's actually um, the fact that this paragraph was in the Paris Agreement was really, really important. Okay, so the next... Um, the next thing to consider is what has happened in between that really key agreement in Paris and, um, you know, in the intervening negotiations. What's been going on? OK, so after Paris, the next round of negotiations agreed that a task force should be should be set up. Basically, a group um, led by states that are already part of the climate change process should be set up to look more specifically at exactly what this paragraph means, right? That ex like, it's all well and good to say that states should be doing this. Um, it's all well and good to say that we acknowledge that governments should be uh, or are encouraged to begin thinking about uh, what climate link migration and displacement means for them and how they're going to deal with it. <clears throat> it's it's okay, you know, it's positive, of course, to say that. But what does it what does it actually mean uh, in reality? What does doing that actually look like? And that's what this task force was set up to do. Basically, it, it, uh, a group um, specifically uh, to look at, at trying to answer those questions was established. And every year at the intervening years between, between the Paris negotiations and nego negotiations in Poland that are going on now, um, this group... Uh, this task force would meet and it would, con it would consider exactly, exactly this question, right? Like, what does it mean for governments to be, um, to be thinking about how they, how they deal with this issue? What does it mean as a state to be engaged properly with uh, the implications of climate link migration and displacement? So that's what, that's what happened in the, in the intervening uh, years between Paris and, and, and this year. And now, so I want to I want to look really quickly at, at what happened this year. So this year, the task force came forward with a set of recommendations. OK, so uh, after after several years of, of consideration, several years of discussion, the task force has uh, has begun to answer this question for states. And rather than mandating them to do anything, rather than kind of saying that they are legally bound to do something or, or anything 
stronger than that. What the task force has done is, is come forward with a set of recommendations, a set of recommendations that um, basically set out the headlines of what governments across the world should be doing if they are serious about um, serious about addressing climate link migration and displacement. And the reason that I think this is important is because, of course, for some governments, um, they are already thinking thinking about this issue and doing things about it, and and that of course is positive and and should carry on. But what having a set of recommendations does is it focuses a state's attention. If they hadn't particularly started considering this issue or started working on it, it gives them um, a set of headline areas to work on. For governments that are already working on it, it gives them a set of areas that they should focus on uh, more than others. And what that means is it begins to draw states together to be working on the same focused areas. And that will inevitably make cooperation easier. It will make working together easier. It will make dealing with this as an international issue easier because states will be working on things under the same headings and their work to some extent will be easier to coordinate for the very fact that they have these areas to focus on. And the areas of focus that they were uh, recommended by the task force were these. Contingency planning, so that basically means uh, what you know what plans does a, does a state have in place for coping with people being forced to move by extreme weather events by the or by the impacts of climate change more broadly so what kind of arrangements are being made in advance of disasters striking um, that will either prevent displacement or help people cope with displacement or help a uh, government uh, manage that episode of displacement better? Like what, what processes, what policies, what plans does, does the government have in place to deal with that? Ha and then I suppose secondarily, how is a government, a central government, working with city authorities, municipal authorities, or kind of regional government to make sure that the people who will actually have to deliver that contingency planning um, are, are, are using the, the wider framework that has been created by the central government. Okay, so that's really key because what we what we know is that climate change is going to begin to alter pattern, uh, patterns of disasters, right? Many kinds of disasters are going to become more frequent, they're going to become more intense, you know, hurricanes are going to become uh, more powerful, um, flash flooding is going to become more frequent. We have all of these kind of, all of these different kinds of disasters which already have the power to displace people and what this recommendation is really saying is what kind of contingency planning do governments have in place to deal with the displacement element of that. Lots of countries obviously are already doing that um, and have been doing it for decades out of necessity but I think it's it's key that they begin to see that um, emergency planning, that contingency planning, not as something that might continue um, as it is now, but as something that we'll need to change uh, and will become more important as climate change impacts begin to worsen. Next one, consultation. Broadly what this means, um, although uh, I think I should add here that because this is still very much in the early days, this is kind of news from the last uh, week or so, you know, there is an element of, of interpretation and, and analysis going on here. We need to see um, exactly kind of what flesh is put onto these bones in, in negotiations as they go forward. Consultation broadly means, you know, asking communities what they, you know, what dealing with climate link migration and displacement means to them. How do they want to cope as a community? What is going to what is going to work for them? What is not going to work for them? How are you going to engage with your citizens? Um, how are you going to consult them about how this challenge is, is going to be met? So I think that's really important that that's in there because we can imagine scenarios where a government might pursue a way of dealing with climate link migration that does not consult with its citizens, that does not consult with civil society, um, that very much sees it as a problem that can be just dealt with in a top-down way without really having to... Um, Without, without really ha having to take into account um, people's opinions, people's wishes, um, 
or people's kind of desire about like the circumstances in, in which they want to move or not move and how they want all of this to be handled. So I think it's really key that this recommendation of consultation is in there. Thirdly, data analysis. So this is something that I think is probably one of the strongest already. We already have um, a lot of data on how climate change impacts are beginning to alter patterns of displacement. Um, but I think it's positive, of course, that this has now become a recommendation because hopefully what that will mean is that um, states, governments begin to uh, see this as, as key, that they begin to collect their own data uh, and use that to make predictions about what is going to happen specifically within their country. So at the moment, we have quite a lot of uh, global data. It's possible for us to look uh, in quite a kind of big picture at trends in displacement, for example, and then we can begin to estimate that as climate change impacts begin to bite, that we might see those, you know, those trends changing. But that's not, that's not kind of specific uh, country level data or even particularly localised data. So I think the fact that data analysis has become a recommendation is really important because it pushes governments, pushes states towards um, having to collect data about what is going on in terms of migration and displacement within their country already and begin to analyse that data to try and help them predict um, what is going to happen in the future. So that's really key. Finally, cooperation, and this sort of goes without saying really because this is an international process that as well as just focusing on migration and displacement linked to climate change within their own countries, that states should, of course, be uh, cooperating, should be coordinating with each other, especially if they are neighbouring countries, especially if they are countries that are capable of rendering assistance to each other in the event of disasters, um, uh, especially if they are countries where people are likely to cross from one country into another as a result of climate change impacts, then of course um, states need to be cooperating, they need to be thinking about how they work together on this. So. Those are the recommendations which have, which have been made by the task force. And I hope what I've done there is sort of map out roughly um, what, those, what those recommendations mean. Um, my view of them is that they are, they, we should see this as really positive. And I don't say that lightly because um, I've been following, I've been following this process for, for a number of years. Um, since before Copenhagen, and I've seen its ups and downs. I've, you know, seen its um, its absolute failures and its flops, and I've seen it grind to a halt. Um, so my sense is that this is that this is positive. That this is real progress. Um, that Paris was obviously a real turning point, and that since then, um, this you know, these recommendations really, really are something useful. Um, and I've been, I've been cynical about the whole process in the past. So I think this is, you know, this is different. And we should look at these recommendations as a key, um, as, as a key milestone. Um, I think we can fairly, con you know, sort of um, confidently say that there's something is, is moving forward. Um, had we gone another year through the negotiations with out something like this, um, then I would be more cynical. I would start to worry. I would be saying, well, um, we've been talking about this every year since Paris, but not very much has happened, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but here we are, here are the recommendations. So I think, I think we need to see that as positive. However, um, the purpose of this session is to look at this whole process critically, um, to look at this, uh, you know, analyze this whole process in terms of whether or not it, um, it, it really truly engages with, with what we need. So, so that's what I'm, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do next. So we can, we can always ask these kind of critical questions about <clears throat> firstly, the whole way migration and displacement is being dealt with at the climate change negotiations and to some extent of, of the climate change negotiations and the COP process itself. 
So I think the first critical point, the first critical question is, is any of this happening fast enough? And I've already said that I, I, I feel like that it's important process, it's important progress, but nonetheless, we can still say, well, it's already the case that people are being displaced by disasters. It is already the case that um, people are being displaced by disasters that have been made worse by climate change. We are seeing new patterns of disasters that are both unprecedented and unexpected happening across the world. And people are already, people are forced to move by them uh, right now. And at the moment, we are not seeing um, governments dealing with that necessarily well. We are not seeing states uh, engaging fully with the fact that those disasters are happening. We are seeing people's rights being vi uh, violated while they are displaced by those disasters. We are seeing these disasters being mismanaged, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you only need to look at the news, and you can, you know, you can see these these tragic events unfolding. So, to some extent, we can we can always say, well, this whole process is late, right? The whole process is late because. Um, we've already got an amount of climate change uh, in the system which is causing these kind of disasters and causing this displacement. And some of that displacement and migration is being handled really badly by governments. So to some extent, we needed um, an agreement on reducing emissions two decades ago. Uh, we needed a uh, more solid agreement on how we manage, how we cope with, how we address the migration and displacement that results from those disasters two decades ago. So. I think on the one hand, we can say progress was made, but I think because of the situation that we're in, because of the urgency of it, because climate change is very much already with us, it is always a legitimate criticism to say, well, none of this has happened fast enough. None of this has happened quickly enough. None of it has happened fast enough, obviously, for the people who are already being displaced by these, by these events. Another key thing is... Um, <clears throat> It is a critical point about uh, about power and accountability at the climate change negotiations. So, I kind of I call this this critical point: who gets to decide, right? Who gets to um, within within the climate change negotiations process? Who is it that gets to decide what happens? Who wields the power, and and what do they do with the power that they wield? And I think. What we can say broadly of the process is that on the one hand, it is more democratic than lots of other global processes. So, for example, if we look at, um, you know, we have we have uh, international processes where uh, the wealthiest countries, the most developed countries um, really do get to kind of decide the rules on their own. Um, and then the climate change negotiations is, is slightly different because actually all countries that want to be represented there uh, can be. However, what is abundantly clear um, about the COP process is that not all countries within the process are equal. And it is certainly true that some countries who are better resourced, uh, who are richer, are able to... Um, kind of pursue their interests uh, within these negotiations much more effectively than countries which have less resources, which are not able to send so many negotiators. So you end up with an imbalance where wealthy countries um, really more often than not um, are pushing for kind of slower, more cautious action, are pushing for... Um, <clears throat> their financial commitments to adaptation to be lower are, you know, are generally pushing for um, the transition from being, you know, high emitting countries to being, um, you know, low emitting countries to be to be gentler, um, and they are able to to use the greater resources that they have within that negotiating process um, to call the shots, whereas. Poorer countries, developing countries, more vulnerable countries simply do not have the negotiating clout to represent their interests, which would be a much faster transition away from fossil fuels, which would be much greater payments towards adaptation, 
which would be faster technology transfer from richer to poorer countries, which would be you know, more adaptation money for, for developing countries and highly vulnerable countries. Um, so their interests are not, you know, are not necessarily aligned and the wealthier countries often get to, get to kind of push their agenda and decide what, what happens and what doesn't happen. So um, to an extent, we still see that. Even though progress is being made, we cannot pretend that the interests of the most climate vulnerable countries or the interests of people who are most at risk from climate linked displacement are being fully represented at the talks or that, they're, um, that the policies, uh, the funding, the frameworks that would fully benefit them um, are, being, are being agreed. So yes progress is happening no it's probably not happening fast enough but then you know when you have a situation this urgent not very much is happening fast enough um yes uh it's positive that um you know recommendations about how to cope with displacement are being are being made but nonetheless those recommendations and the process as a whole probably still reflects the interests of the high emitting countries more than it represents the interests of the low emitting vulnerable countries so we need to we need to kind of balance uh, any enthusiasm and positivity about progress with these reminders that um, that it is still high emitting countries um, who are probably dragging their feet a bit on this process the next critical point that I want to make is about the area of the negotiations um, that migration and displacement is, is discussed and agreed upon within, right? And the, the area, the kind of <clears throat> subset of negotiations where migration and displacement is handled is, is called lo loss and damage. And I think that um, just the fact that it's handled within this particular part of the talks is is a really important point. It's not a, it's not a critical point in, in the sense that the other ones are, but I think just raising the fact of where, uh, like the circumstances under which these um, agreements on migration and displacement happen is really key. So one way of looking at how the climate change negotiations are structured is to break them down into these, these three different processes that take place. Now, this is a very kind of zoomed out helicopter view of the process. If you, if you actually get into the nitty gritty of it, you get into kind of all sorts of different groups which have kind of hundreds and hundreds of incomprehensible acronyms. But kind of looking at it, uh, zoomed right out, looking at it from a distance, there are, there are three really important things that are going on as part of the climate negotiations. Firstly is, is discussion of emissions reductions, right? How, you know, how much carbon do we need to get out of the system um, and how quickly? Right? and who is going to do it and by when. Really, it's states arguing with each other about who is going to cut their carbon emissions fastest. Right? So that's thing number one, emissions reduction. Second thing is that right from the beginning of the process, there was this idea that we cannot completely stop climate change. It's not possible to um, actually do emissions reduction fast enough um, that we simply will stop it, right? That global temperatures won't change, that uh, everything will basically carry on as normal. And it was recognised very early on that even with the most ambitious um, emissions reductions targets, that some climate change would happen and that would have impacts and that we would in some way need to adapt to those impacts, right? that there is inevitably going to be um, kind of alterations to our planet, to our ecosystems, to our weather, to what we can grow and can't grow, um, to, to the whole planetary system, which will, which will definitely happen, which are inevitable. And as societies, as countries, as communities, as whatever scale you want to look at it, we will have to adapt to some climate change. We will have to change how we live, where we live, um, what we grow, et cetera, et cetera, so that, we can, so that we can cope with these climate change impacts or so that we can adapt to them. 
The idea of adaptation really was that, <clears throat> although it might mean changing, um, that nonetheless it would maintain um, sort of certain aspects of our, of our quality of life, right? Now, this, this final point, this idea of loss and damage, uh, then really started to emerge uh, over the last sort of five or so years. And the idea of loss and damage is to say, well, okay, thing number one, there are, we can't completely mitigate climate change. We can't completely stop it. There will be some warming and that warming will have impacts. Okay, first point. Second point, we will be able to adapt to some of those impacts in a way that sort of roughly uh, maintains the continuity of our societies. Okay, but that's going to be expensive. But that's, you know, by and large, that's possible. The idea of loss and damage is that there are some climate change impacts which we cannot adapt to. There are some impacts which are so big, so catastrophic, um, so dangerous, that actually it is not possible to fully adapt to those impacts. Adaptation in these circumstances just isn't possible. And it is those kind of impacts that are talked about within this framework of loss and damage. They are things that are lost, uh, things that are damaged, things really that can't be adapted to, okay? And within this loss and damage framework is where the, all the negotiating, all the agreeing, uh, all the process around migration and displacement takes place. So what it's saying is displacement essentially is, is a loss or a damage. It's, it's something that is, um, uh, it's, not, it, it's not a form of adaptation. This is, you know, this is a kind of <clears throat> an impact that, that, that we can't adapt to and along with all kinds of other impacts that are so serious that we can't adapt to them, uh, what do we do? Well, they go into this, this area of loss and damage. And what I, what I want to do is just say a few kind of critical points about the fact that by and large displacement is discussed within this, this framework of loss and damage. And the first one is to bring in this idea of migration as climate change adaptation. So what this is saying is that, look, for some people, um, staying where they are simply won't be possible. Um, and should we not, given, given that that's the case, should we not be saying that migration, when it is freely chosen, when it is facilitated, when people want to do it, um, should that not become part um, of a viable, empowering climate change adap adaptation strategy for them? You know, are there not some people for whom migration would actually be a positive way to address the fact that they are highly exposed to climate change impacts? And that's slightly at odds with this idea of loss and damage, which tends to see everything within its purview um, as being like as as being wholly negative, as being something that has been, that has been destroyed um, and that therefore needs to be kind of compensated. So I think, I think that's, I, I'm not suggesting here that um, this is the wrong place for migration and displacement to be, to be discussed and debated within the climate talks, but I am suggesting that there are elements, there are ways of thinking about climate link migration, which don't always fit comfortably within this, this loss and damage framework. So, um, what I want to do now is give you a bit of a sense of what is going on outside of the climate change negotiations when it comes to climate link migration and displacement. And I know this, I know this was billed as what's happening, at the, what's happening in terms of displacement at the climate talks, but I think it's also really key to understand um, what else is going on uh, within this global policy arena, because actually the climate negotiations are one part of this of this puzzle, um, one one place that this issue is being discussed, and it's really key to understand what can and can't be agreed within this process, and what can and can't be agreed at other international processes outside of the climate talks. So we begin to get a picture of how all of these things. Uh, fit together because that's a really key part of 
of being able to interrogate this question of, you know, is what's happening at the climate talks enough? In order to answer that, we need to be able to say, well, what else is going on, in, you know, at other processes? And is that filling in the gaps? Do these things all kind of fit together into some kind of comprehensive picture or, or don't they? So we do need to look at what's going on outside of the climate process in order to understand its, its implications. So um, these, these are just the kind of summary of the critical points, though. Um, <clears throat> the case for the climate process is, well, lots of countries are already involved, it's already happening, and there's representation from vulnerable countries. That's positive. Um, the case against it and when I say the case against it, what I really mean is the case for also negotiating and agreeing uh, on climate link migration outside of the climate process, somewhere else, okay? Like, what arguments can we make for saying, well, we also need to be talking about this in some other forum, agreeing on this at some other forum as well? And the key ones are, well, the climate change no uh, negotiations are notoriously slow, we are now at COP24, which means this is the 24th year that um, countries have met and, and you know, negotiated and agreed and not agreed. So it's a slow process. Could there be another uh, process outside of the climate talks, which is quicker, which might yield results faster? The second point is that a huge amount of the migration and displacement that we are going to see is going to be internal. It's going to be about people moving within their own country. Now, that means that um, essentially it is an issue of domestic law or how countries choose to implement uh, kind of national, uh, sorry, how countries choose to, to implement or not implement uh, internationally agreed things into their domestic law. Now, the climate process is very much geared up for uh, states agreeing things between each other where, um, where it's essential that, uh, that one government agrees something with another government because it affects both of them. Now, with internal migration and internal displacement, you can make the case that, well, this is actually a domestic issue for individual countries. So is the climate change negotiations really the best place to try and um, to try and agree that a lot of countries might quite legitimately say well how we um, how we deal with internal migration is a matter of domestic policy for us it's not something that we necessarily want to bring to a huge global process uh, and agree upon finally um, one of the key issues that comes up in terms of policy um, <clears throat> when we're thinking about climate link migration is this question of legal protection. And what this really means is, what are the legal rights of people who are migrate or are displaced by uh, climate linked events, right? What's their legal status? Um, because it's clear at the moment that they don't really, f they're, well, they're, they're not covered by the refugee convention. They don't count as, you know, they don't count as refugees because they're not fleeing persecution. They don't necessarily count as migrants in, in a legal sense because they may not have crossed an international border. So for many people who, uh, whose mobility is in some way driven by a climate link hazard, their legal status is not completely clear. Now, that's something that needs to be agreed upon. It's something that needs to be addressed. But we can, we can say, well, is the international climate change process really the best forum for that? Um, it's certainly a forum where countries can agree, or, or as the case may not agree, on emissions reduction, on commitments around uh, the burning and extraction of fossil fuels, on, on deforestation, on, on transfers of money between countries for adaptation, all of these kind of things. But it doesn't really have... Um, the, it's not really geared up to deal with human rights. It's not really geared up to deal with individual people's rights. It's really geared up for states to negotiate with each other. And I'm not saying that human rights are absent from uh, the principles that many states uh, undertake those negotiations on, but nonetheless, the climate change negotiations, the COP process, was never going to be a place that would create a new legal status, that would create 
uh, a system of rights for people who move in the context of climate change. So for these reasons, I think it's key that there are other international fora where climate link migration is, is discussed uh, and agreed upon. So what are those places? <clears throat> Um, and what I'm going to do is go through just really quickly because we're we're sort of reaching the end of the session, and I'd like to, um, I'd I'd like to have some time for questions. Um, what are those places? What are those other global fora where where this issue is or could be addressed? The first one that I want to mention is the Migration Compact, and the reason that I'm putting this at the top of the list is because um, this week both. The climate process and the migration compact are being negotiated and agreed upon at the same time. The climate process going on uh, in Poland, in Katowice, um, the migration compact going, uh, going on being agreed upon at Marrakesh in Morocco. So for, for people working on climate link migration, um, this, was, this was basically the huge question, which one, <laughs> which one do you go to? Um, in the end, I didn't go to either of them. I sort of followed them from, from afar. Um, anyway, that's, that's not so important. But what I want to say about the Migration Compact is, um, is broadly that I think um, it's, it's positive that the Migration Compact happened. Um, I think what is happening within that process concerning uh, climate change is, is really interesting and is also... I think at the moment unclear. Okay, um, so what's happened is there is this there is this global process where countries are coming to, together and they are saying, given that um, we are now in an era where migration uh, is fundamentally different to the last time that states all got together and, and agreed on how they were going to handle people crossing borders, given that we are now in a sort of fundamentally different era of human mobility, we need something that's, ge that's geared up for this new kind of highly, highly mobile kind of global migration situation that we find ourselves in in the 21st century. So that's a very, you know, that's a very sensible um, thing to do. Amongst... Um, Amongst the documentation, amongst what this agreement is, it also talks about the drivers of migration. Okay, as well as talking about um, how states should uh, treat migrants from other countries when they are when they are in their country, um, and setting out some ground rules for that, albeit not in a legally binding way, it does also discuss the drivers of migration and amongst those drivers, it does mention climate change. So this is really important because what we have is a global process where states are coming together, they're agreeing, they are saying, as well as signing, signing on the dotted line about how they treat migrants in their countries, how they respect their rights, they are also saying, we acknowledge that climate change is a driver of migration. So that's really important. And while I think we can say that it's positive that states have have signed up to this, this agreement on, on the rights of migrants in their countries, I would say at the moment it's unclear what the implications of them acknowledging climate change as a driver of migration are. It's, it's not completely clear what acknowledging that commits them to. My analysis of it is that more than anything it is political leverage further down the line. It means that for any country that has been part of the migration compact, uh, that has signed up to it, which is, you know, being fairly universal with a few big exceptions, um, it means that you can then say to that state, it means that you can then say to that government, look, you do acknowledge that climate change is a driver of migration. This, uh, this is something that your government, that you as a state, Think is real and that because you have acknowledged the reality of this perhaps there are therefore also other things beyond your commitments within the migration compact that you should be doing so i think it's unclear that it whether or not it commits them to anything in reality now but nonetheless the fact that they have acknowledged it within an agreement that they have signed up to 
is a really key advocacy tool. It's a key point of leverage. It's a way of engaging states which perhaps are trying to disengage from this issue. It's a way of raising this issue with governments which perhaps are not that keen on discussing it or doing anything about it. You can say, well, actually, no, look, you've, you've agreed to this wider framework which contains this language about climate change being a driver of migration. So you have sort of fundamentally agreed that, that this is real and it's happening. Uh, so I think, I think that, that is, that's, the, that's the key thing that this is going to do, rather than some more obvious, straightforward commitment. Okay, so that's the migration compact. The second thing that I think is really, really important and is probably one of the most under-discussed but most crucial global processes when it comes to this is the platform on disaster displacement. And this is really key because this actually is states agreeing on what the rights of people are when they've crossed an international border due to a disaster, right? So this, this goes right, right to the heart of, of the key dilemma of climate link migration, right? To the key legal, the heart of the key legal and policy issue. It says, what, what exactly are the rights of someone who fleeing a natural, fleeing a disaster, fleeing a climate change impact, crosses an international border and then for whatever reason um, doesn't want to or cannot return to their original location what like what are their rights that's been one of the defining questions of this field and the platform on disaster displacement has basically been setting out to try and reach an agreement on that between states now because um, agreeing something like that is obviously hugely hugely controversial um, there are lots and lots of governments which would not want to kind of do at, well. They would see it as opening up essentially a new a new migration category, a new way, a new legal right for people to remain in their country. So the platform on disaster displacement has done this very diplomatically, very delicately. But over the years, it has um, that kind of diplomacy has succeeded in bringing over a hundred countries into. Um, into a conversation and eventually signing up to a set of non-binding principles about how, how they treat, how they respect the rights of people who have crossed into their countries as a result of climate change impacts. So that's really key. And the, the kind of reinforcing and expansion of the platform on disaster displacement is really important as well. I'm going to say a couple of things quickly about the Sendai framework and <coughs> um, the SDGs. And these, I think, are, um, I mean, I should explain really quickly what they are. The Sendai framework uh, sets out how states cooperate um, during, during disasters and catastrophes. It's, it's basically a set of, set of global principles on, on, on how governments deal with, with disasters. So, of course, that's really, well, how governments deal with disasters and how, how states manage the risk of disasters. Okay, um, so obviously climate change is really, really pertinent to this because what we're seeing essentially as climate change begins to bite is patterns of existing disasters getting worse. So how states uh, manage the risk of those disasters is really key and how states cooperate during those disasters is really important. And as we begin to see climate change taking effect, having kind of universal standards, global standards on disaster risk reduction, disaster management, cooperation during disasters will become more and more important. And that's what the Sendai framework sets out very roughly um, to do. So while it doesn't necessarily contain language about climate link migration or displacement, while it doesn't necessarily say uh, that you know, migration linked to climate change is um, is a reality or is key in the way that the migration compact does. In a way, that doesn't matter because what's in, what's key about the Sendai framework is it's saying, well, in an era of climate change, uh, or kind of you know, as we move forward, the, the Sendai framework covers the next fifteen years. In the next fifteen years, it's really key that governments have these um, have these principles, have these standards on disaster. Uh, disaster risk reduction and disaster management um, and simply by doing that they will be going a long way to addressing issues around climate link migration 
Um, the st Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, I think um, are, are really interesting when it comes to climate-linked migration, mainly for the reason that it, it isn't completely clear how uh, climate-linked migration fits into them. But it does feel to me like it, uh, like it does. <laughs> and I know that sounds like perhaps like not a very... Uh, uh, not a very coherent answer, but when you look at when you look at the SDGs, when you look when you look at what they are, you know there are there are goals on pretty much every single thing that has some bearing on climate link migration, right? Uh, on poverty, on water, access to water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know there are um, there there are goals related to each of these things which are really pertinent to climate link migration. So my my view of them has always been that. Provided that um, states are serious about the SDGs, provided that, that provided that they do become, um, you know, a framework for, for thinking about about development, there there should be ways, uh, if we're smart, to use the the SDGs or use states' commitment to the SDGs to improve the way those states deal with climate link migration and displacement. So I stand by this idea that the SDGs are really important for climate link migration for that reason. However, I think it's also true that understanding exactly how you would leverage um, a state's commitment to the SDGs in order to improve how it deals with climate link migration is, um, is still kind of really complex and really un undecided. Um, but nonetheless, I think you, what you have there in that process, in, in the framework of the SDGs, is another tool, um, is, is another point of leverage for climate link migration. So, those are the other processes that I think are, that I think are important. Um, and my view uh, of them is that they all do different things, right? No, like no one of them is the process that we have to pursue. It's not like we're in a position where we can say, oh, actually, one of these processes does everything that we need to do and all of our focus, all of our energy should go into that and the other ones don't really matter. Actually, what we've ended up with, um, for better or worse, is a situation where climate link migration is being discussed, negotiated, and agreed upon, really in five different processes, each of which does something slightly different. So we've got the COP climate process, we've got the migration compact, we've got the platform on disaster displacement, we've got Sendai framework, and we've got the SDGs. And each of those does something slightly different. It, it, is, another, it is another piece of the puzzle. It's another way of, of addressing climate link migration. So on the one hand, frustrating that there isn't you know one place where this is happening however on the other hand um it is an enormously complicated topic so perhaps it's right that it is addressed through these various different processes perhaps we should see that as a strength uh, rather than a weakness <laughs>